Well, good evening. Hello, guys. It's good to see you. I love this room full. Let me also welcome you to the best night of the week here at Grace Church. Uh, my name is LB, and I have the honor of serving with Next Students. And one of my favorite parts of my job being that I get to serve with the foundations. Where are my seniors? Come on. I love you guys. I love you guys. Shout out to my seniors. Uh, they have been preparing, uh, like David mentioned, they've been preparing for this retreat, and it's, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, so I, I saw a lot of you guys are signed up. Uh, if you're still on the fence, we will make room for you. Uh, if money is an object, we will help cover your expenses. Like, we, uh, we want as many people there as possible. Uh, flip with me in your, in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 17. And just stick your thumb in there because that's where we're going to be later tonight. If you don't have a Bible with you or app or whatever, we're going to have the passage up on the screen. Uh, if you're newer to faith in Christ tonight, uh, my hope is that my, my comments, my words are going to help set you out on a, on a good, healthy trajectory. And if you're someone who's been around the faith, maybe, maybe you're like me and you were, uh, you know, practically raised in the church and raised by the church, uh, you, like I said, like myself, may need a bit of a reorientation on some things that may actually feel familiar. Uh, so don't check out on me. Uh, it may feel familiar, but uh, I promise you it's powerful. Uh, who here likes math? Anyone? more people than I thought, uh, more people than I thought. Uh, I, I am terrible, terrible at math. And uh, if I'm being honest with you, my main problem with math, quite frankly, uh, is the numbers. Anyone else? That's, that's your main problem with math? Uh, now, now, I've not been diagnosed with any sort of number dyslexia, and I don't even know that that's really a thing, uh, but I'm pretty sure that I have it. If you tell me your phone number and tell me to tell it right back to you, I can probably get all of the numbers in there, but they certainly will not be in the right order. Uh, and, and I couldn't tell you what my Enneagram number is, uh, because quite frankly, I, I could, can't recall. Uh, I'm told seven, eight, maybe? I don't know, people who know Enneagram, I don't know Enneagram, not because I'm like against it, I just, it's numbers. Uh, and then on Sunday, just this last Sunday, I forgot my favorite soccer player's jersey number. It's 14, uh, I know that because I have it written in my notes, uh, but I swear it was 17, so I like look at her, her Instagram and I'm like, oh, she switched her number to 14. No. Nope, it's always been 14. I've been watching her play for years. Uh, and to make matters worse in math, they, whoever like the math people are, uh, decide to add complex things like imaginary numbers. Like as if numbers aren't hard enough, now we're making up imaginary numbers? <sighs> all, all this stuff makes no sense to me. You know, I, I actually majored in youth ministry and the Bible so that I wouldn't have to do math. Um, I'm kidding, kind of. Uh, uh, but there are people, there are some of you in this room who do like math. And uh, what I'm told by the, those of you who do like math, and I legitimately Googled it, like, what do people who like math say? Like, why do they like math? Because like, I don't know. Uh, and, and the people who do like math uh, say that they like math because there is, there is no ambiguity in math. Uh, if, you, if you do all of the steps correctly, it will always be consistent. It will always be right. Two plus two will always be, who said five? Stop it. It will always be four. Math is logical. Math works. And as fallen, broken people, we appreciate that consistency. The accuracy, the clarity, the perfection and logic of all of it. In fact, we, we long for that in our lives. And I get that because I long for that too. Uh, that longing, by the way, that we feel is because we are hardwired to long for a perfect God. Now, many of us really want our faith to be like math. 
where if I do all the right steps, it's going to work out like I think it should. But, try as we may, faith is not like math. Let me, let me pray for us and I'll jump into Matthew 17. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. So Spirit, guard my tongue tonight as I speak. May my words be words from the Father and let your Spirit stir hearts in ways that only he can. And when, you, when we open your word together, Lord, I, I pray that Jesus is glorified. And it's in that name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. All right, so let's look at Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. I'm going to read it. It's going to be up here on the screens. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, if you're a little bit of a nerd like me, you've noticed some structure. I'm a nerd, guys. I'm really sorry. Anyone else in here with me on that? All right, cool. I'm glad I'm not alone. Uh, there's some structure here. In verses 14 to 18, we see a situation. And then in verses 19 and 20, we see an explanation. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to I start with a little bit of context of this passage. Uh, if we're friends, you know my favorite thing about the Bible is context. Yeah, uh, Trinity literally said that with me. Uh, so the context of this passage is that Jesus just came down off the mountain where the transfiguration took place. Now, transfiguration is a really cool thing that I do not have enough time tonight to go into. Uh, but quickly, briefly, Jesus takes three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain, which is now known as the Mount of Transfiguration, conveniently enough. And then uh, while they're up on the mountain... This is what Matthew 17, verses 2 and 3 says. It says, Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, ap there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now, the disciples have no clue what's going on at this point. Uh, they're just up on this mountain with Jesus, and all of a sudden Jesus gets like radiant white, and then Moses and Elijah show up. They're chatting with Jesus. So these disciples are like, uh, should we build a tent? Like, it's really funny. So look into it. Uh, but as soon, just, they're still trying to wrap their mind around this, and out of a bright cloud, God the Father speaks in verse 5, and he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to, hi to him. Now, needless to say, for the disciples, this is a mountaintop experience. Uh, do you all know what I mean when I say a mountaintop experience? Like, this is high. This is a high point uh, in their life and their faith. Uh, so, so that's the context. They're coming off this mountain to this situation. And the situation here we see in verse 14 is that there was a demon-possessed boy causing himself life-threatening bodily harm. And the dad, like most dads would, wanted his son to be healed. And so he took his son to the disciples whom he had heard had been able to heal for some reason, he was, they were unable to heal this boy. Now, both the father and the disciples were undoubtedly very disappointed uh, about this reality, and so they brought him to Jesus. 
Now, who in verse 17, and I, I think we can get on the screen, who in verse 17 uh, Jesus is speaking to is unclear. Uh, he seems to get a little bit heated here. Um, but what we do know, it might be the disciples, it might be the religious leaders, uh, but we do know, we can know for certain, is that Jesus is drawing a sharp separation from faith in general to faith in him. And faith that has power. And we see that Jesus does, in fact, have the power to heal this boy. And he heals him instantly. And I love that Matthew includes that word because I think it's powerful. He heals him instantly. Now, verses 8, 19 and 20 make me chuckle a little bit because I'm a visual person. Uh, so I can kind of see this picture. Uh, you know, everyone is smiling. Oh, we're all happy. The boy got healed. This is great. The disciples are like, oh, good. Yay, he's healed, right? And then as soon as they like, but can, can, we, just, can we just talk to you just for, just, for, just for a second? This is so great. We're so glad you're healed. And then they like get into their little, their little holy huddle, and the disciples just are like, what? Like, why couldn't we do it? What? Like, we were able to do it before, we had the power to cast out demons, and now we don't have the power to cast out demons? Like, what the heck is going on? Why doesn't our faith work? And Jesus' response, I'm sure, was a bit confusing and maybe even disheartening, because you see, three of these guys had just been up on the mountain with Jesus, and it was amazing. This moment must have been a total letdown. And as a side note, I find that most of my mountaintop experiences are followed by a bit of an emotional dip. Uh, some of you may identify with that as well. Often something disheartening serves to remind me again that the mountaintop experience was not a result of my doing, but of what Christ has already done. Now, Jesus' answer is one that many of us have heard before. He says, because of your little faith, for truly, I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And he's at the base of a mountain, right? They just came off this mountain, so he's literally probably pointing to the mountain. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Their faith going into this experience had been in their ability to heal, not in the person of Jesus. And Jesus tells them, just a little bit of faith in me rather than in your own abilities, and you're going to see some crazy stuff. Now, what does this tell us about faith? I believe this story, there are three key things that we can take away that tells us about faith. And the first is this. The object of our faith is where the power is. The object of our faith is where the power is. Slapping Jesus' name on something doesn't mean we're submitting to the authority of Jesus. Does that make sense? You guys tracking with me on that? The power isn't in the name Jesus. In fact, there are a lot of people throughout history that bear the name Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Like there, there's a lot of people with the name Jesus. The power is in the person of Jesus. I loved that worship song that we sang second because it's like, there's my message right there in that song. I don't even need to speak tonight. It's already there. The power is in the person of Jesus. It's not in the amount of faith that we have that saves us. It's not the amount of faith that gives us hope and peace and power and strength. It's the object of our faith, the thing that our faith rests on, Jesus. So let me try to make this a little bit stickier. I can have faith all day long that my Chicago Cubs are going to bring home the World Series championship this year. I can believe it with all of my heart, with sincerity, but I will guarantee you that that object of faith will let me down. <laughs> we have a saying as Cubs fans uh, during spring training, there's always next year. Uh, and, you know, Vegas odds and the whole player strike thing uh, is probably going to prove that to be right. The problem isn't my faith 
the problem is the object of my faith. But you know what's not going to let me down? I'll tell you, it's a triune God that's three in one. It's a God who quite literally knows everything. A God who never changes, has no limits, cannot be contained, and is morally perfect. A God who is slow to anger and is righteous. He's so righteous, in fact, that unrighteousness brings out his wrath. He's understanding and his wisdom is inscrutable and whatever he says is truth. He makes promises to his people and he keeps them even when we don't. He's loving in ways we cannot even begin to imagine. And he's so loving, in fact, that scripture actually says he is love. He's transcendent, existing completely other from his creation. He's incomprehensible. He is just. He is good. He is kind. He is merciful. He is eternal. And he is everlasting. That is is a source of power that will not fail. Your belief, your faith itself cannot be what you're confident in. Students regularly tell me, uh, hey, I'm just, I'm just really struggling with my faith. My faith is really struggling. And, and I'll be the first to tell you my faith gets shaken I've been in professional youth ministry for 17 years. My faith gets shaken. But while my faith gets shaken, the object of my faith never falters. When my faith is shaking, it's, it's more about me than it is about the object of my faith. Now, luckily, luckily, thank God, we are saved based on the object of our faith and not the effort of our faith. Anyone else? Amen, right? Oh, I'm so grateful for that. Thomas, who's my second favorite Bible guy, uh, and all, well, third, Jesus, okay? Uh, John is my, John is my other favorite, uh, so, so Thomas, there are elements of Thomas's faith that we see throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, uh, that, that doesn't make sense to him. Like, he's got genuine faith, but it doesn't all make sense. Uh, and I identify with that because of all those attributes I listed about God. Like, those don't all make sense to me all the time. Uh, so, so Thomas's faith doesn't always make sense to him, and it feels shaky to him. So, in my opinion... He has authentic questions and is bold enough to ask them. And Jesus never gets mad at him. He, in fact, answers Thomas's questions. In John 14, uh, this is part of Jesus' last recorded conversations with his disciples. He says to them, you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas, and again, I can just picture this scene. He's sitting in the upper room with his 12 and... uh, And he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And I can just see all 12 of them, like, except for Judas, he was distracted. Uh, But but all, all 11 of them, their minds are just spinning. Okay, he says we know the way to where he's going. We have no idea where he's going. But he said we know the way to where he's going. So, so they're confused. And Thomas is the only one bold enough to say this. And this is what he says. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? That's a great question. Am I right? That's a great question. There are things about God that don't make sense. And that's because God is so much bigger than us. It's a good thing that our faith faith is not based on what we understand, but on who God is. Thomas gets a bad rap as a doubter as if his questions somehow are a black mark against his character. But I think he's just authentic and willing to ask things out loud when he doesn't understand them. And I think that that is actually a great quality for a Christ follower. Now, do you know what Jesus' response to that particular question was? This is so great. This is one of the foundational verses of our entire faith that if Thomas hadn't been bold enough to ask the question, we wouldn't have the answer today. This is the answer. John 14, 6. Many of you can probably quote it. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How cool that we get that because Thomas was bold enough. When faith for you is more about how much or how little of it you have, rather than in the object of what your faith is, you're you're likely starting to wander down the wrong path. So I'll ask you, do you depend on your faith or do you depend on the object of your faith? I know when I was your age sitting there, I, I was way more dependent on my faith than I was on the object of my faith. Second point that I think this passage teaches us about faith is that there is evil in the world. I wish there wasn't. Like, I really do. But there is, and it's a reality that we must come to terms with. The little boy in this story had a demonic possession, and we see evil in our world all around us. It may look a little bit different, but the enemy is not neutral, nor is he stagnant. And the second that we forget that, we're in trouble. And we generally don't need to do much searching to find evidence of this reality, but right now, even as I'm speaking, there are men, women, and children who are in grave danger in Ukraine. It appears that an arrogant dictator is doing everything he can to grab power, and as a result, lives are being lost. And the persecution of Christians is ramping up in the entire region. I don't pretend to be an expert in geopolitics, and I'm genuinely not trying to act like I am. But the evil in this situation is really clear. It's really clear. Aaron Pierce shared on Sunday about some of the work Steiger International is doing in in Russia and Ukraine and other countries in that area. And, And we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters as they get the opportunity to reflect Christ in the middle of a wartime crisis that really can only be described as evil. Now, sometimes because of the bubble that many of us live in, I know that I live in, we forget that Jesus doesn't actually say, follow me and I'll make it easy and smooth sailing and get rid of all evil immediately. In fact, (laughs) dang it, uh, he basically says the opposite. (laughs) Jesus tells his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. We're not exempt from the effects of evils of his followers of Jesus, but we have confidence that in the midst of it, that the object of our faith walks with us and will overcome all of it in the end. Amen? So are you aware? Are you aware of the evil that you will be confronted with as a follower of Jesus? And, and this brings me to my final point. Point number three that I think this passage teaches us about faith. There is no faith formula, only a relationship with Jesus. There's no faith formula, only a relationship with Jesus. In God's economy, in the the economy of the kingdom, it's not three hours of Bible study and two hours of prayer equals one demon possession exorcism. It's not how it works. It's just not how it works. I mean, there are times that I'm like, it would be really cool if it was, but, but it's, it's not how it works. The disciples' faith was in their ability to heal, and, and that didn't work consistently. If, if your faith isn't, if, you, if, you, if you're sitting here tonight and you feel like, man, my faith isn't working for me. I know I've felt that at different times. If you're feeling like your faith isn't working for you, let me tell you, you're probably, I don't know your heart, so I can't like say this definitively, but there's a good chance that you're more concerned about doing your faith than about drawing near to the one you have faith in. Or you may be more concerned about the results of your faith than the person that your faith rests on. So draw near to him. Get close to him. Get to know him. Wrestle with the unknowns. Question what you hear. Question what's said on this stage. Listen to different voices and test them all against scripture. Read God's word. 
Not to check a box, but to know more about the character of God. And right now, I'm reading Numbers, ironically, I promise. I'm not even kidding. Uh, I'm in the book of Numbers uh, in my year in a Bible, uh, year through the Bible plan. And um, you know what I see there in the book of Numbers about God? I see that he hates evil. I see that he longs for relationship with his people. I see that he cares about the poor and the outcast. I see that he is intentional and relational in his plan for his people broken and fallen and in need of a savior. That's what I see about God in the book of Numbers. See, relationships, they don't have formulas, they have principles. Relationships don't have formulas, they have principles. If you spend more time hanging out with a person, you'll likely get to know them more. It's a principle. If you intentionally spend time with someone, you will absolutely get to know them more. And not just facts about them, but actually know them, what their passions are, what makes them tick. And in addition to principles, relationships also have promises. Because we're human, we often break promises. <laughs> you know, I'm guilty of that. But God doesn't break promises. So when scripture says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you in James 4, it's a promise. When the author of Hebrews reminds his hearers that God will never leave them or forsake them, it's a promise. And in John chapter 14, when Jesus says that the Father will send us an advocate, the Holy Spirit, to guide us and to help us and to remind us what Jesus taught, that is a promise. And when we, as, as your staff who love you, and when your small group leaders tell you to go to church, to engage in community and in worship and to read your Bible and to pray, we're not telling you to do those things because there are, those are the things that will make you a better Christian. We're telling you those things because those are the things that are going to put you in the way of growing deeper in a relationship with Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis calls this concept the good infection. Uh, I think we're all a little too familiar with the concept of infection these days. Uh, but his, his point, and he, he asks, are you cold and you want to get warm? Move closer to a fire. Is your mouth dry and you're thirsty? Drink a glass of water. Lewis says this, um, that it is likewise if you want joy, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. We don't read our Bible because we're supposed to or to check a box or because that's what you do if you have faith. Read your Bible to enter a deeper relationship with God. And as a side note, if, if you're only ever looking for yourself in Scripture, what you should be doing or not doing, how it applies to your life and if you're not actively also searching for what you can learn about God and who he is, you're missing out. Because that is how we grow in a relationship with someone, by drawing near to them. So here's my question for you tonight. Are you trying to treat your faith like a math problem or like a relationship? This whole message started... Uh, with a post-mountaintop experience where the disciples couldn't seem to cast out a demon. <laughs> but what it teaches us about faith is that the object of our faith is where the power is. That there is evil in this world and that there is no faith formula, only a relationship with Jesus. Let me pray for us. God, I'm so grateful that, that, our, that we get a relationship with you and that faith is not like math. And not just because I hate math. But God, because math is comprehens comprehensible. And if I could understand everything about you, that would make you a pretty weak God. I'm grateful that you're a stronger God than that. 
Thank you for being all those things that, we, that I read, that you are kind, that you're loving, that you're righteous, that you are wrathful towards unrighteousness, that you are jealous for us, that you love us, that you make a way for us. By sending your son, you didn't have to do that. We don't deserve it. Lord, I pray that, that we would understand the nuance of our faith and trying to do faith versus leaning into you and getting to know you. Externally, Lord, that can look really similar for two different people. But it's a heart issue. And the heart of the issue is that the heart is always the issue. So, Lord, I pray that you would uh, test our hearts, that you would know our ways Not that you would test our hearts so that you could see them, you already do, but that you would test our hearts and bring to mind and show us the areas that we're not built on you, we're we're, we're trying to depend on ourselves. God, I pray specifically for students in this room who have questions and are too scared to ask them because they think it might make their faith look weak. I pray that they would ask those questions to trusted people. God, I, I, I'm convinced the, the more I get to know you, the less I realize I know about you and the more I want to know you. Teach us who you are. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. We thank you for that promise. Lord, I pray as we head into our, our small groups tonight, Lord, that you would just spark conversation, spark questions, spark challenges, and help us to, to leave tonight more in love with you than when we came in tonight, not because of something that's said from this stage, but because of the reality of the Holy Spirit that's at work through your word. We love you, Jesus. We're thankful for this time together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.